He seemed like a loving father and a devoted believer. Yet one afternoon, he took his gun and brutally shot his wife, his mother, and all his children. Then cunningly staged his own death to escape justice. These are the stories of 10 serial killers who faked their own death. Number 10, Albert Fish. He was dead then. I stuck the knife in his belly and held my mouth to his body and drank his blood. July 14, 1924. Albert Fish tricked the kid named Francis McDonnelly into going into the woods by saying they were going to play catch. But he attacked, strangled, and chopped up Francis's body and left him hanging from a tree near his house. But that's just the start of Fish's twisted behavior. February 11, 1927, Fish kidnapped another kid named William Billy Gaffney and his buddy, Billy Beaton, from an apartment in Brooklyn. They never found Gaffney, and although they couldn't find his body, Albert eventually confessed to killing him. Makes you wonder how the hell things ended up like this. Born May 19, 1870, in Washington, D.C., Fish's life would take a dark turn when he would move to New York during his early adulthood. There, he got into some dark stuff, like being involved in prostitution and getting his hands on boys. 1910. He went for his first kill with a 19-year-old guy named Thomas Bedden, which turned into straight-up torture. Eventually, Fish chopped off half of Bedden's genitals and left him to suffer, and it didn't stop there. Fish leveled up his crimes and brutally stabbed a mentally disabled boy in Georgetown, specifically going after victims he thought no one would care about. And many years later, Fish would pull off a cruel act by tricking Grace Budd into going to an abandoned house, telling her there was going to be a dope birthday party. But once she got there, he mercilessly killed her, cut off her head, and actually ate her body. November 1934. They finally apprehended Fish when someone sent an anonymous letter connecting him to the Bud murder. They took him to trial, and he went with the plea of insanity. A bunch of shrinks would testify about his messed up fetishes and disturbing religious beliefs. January 16, 1936, even though he claimed he was nuts, they still found him guilty. They sentenced him to get fried in the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison finally putting an end to this disturbing chapter in America's serial killer history. But here's the twist. Some folks actually think Fish might have pulled a fast one on everyone. They theorized that the needles stuck inside him interfered with the electric chair's operation, allowing him to survive that execution and vanish afterwards. Yeah, pretty creepy. Well, that's the mystery surrounding this sicko. Number 9. Dennis Rader No, that was part of my... Uh I guess my what you call fantasy, these people were uh, selected. Now, when you use the term fantasy, is this something you were doing for your personal pleasure? Uh, it's fantasy, sir. January 1974 in good old Wichita, Kansas. Dennis Rader, also known as the BTK killer, went on a terrifying killing spree. His first victims? A whole family of four, tragically strangled right in their own home. The twisted part? No sign of any sexual assault despite semen at the scene. Just a few months later, he would strike again, this time targeting a 21-year-old girl named Catherine Doreen Bright. He would break into the house coming across her 19-year-old brother, Kevin Bright. Although getting shot, he managed to escape. Catherine wouldn't be so fortunate. Raider ended up stabbing her three times in the back and lower gut before leaving the scene. Oh wait, it gets even more twisted. The sick freak had the audacity to leave a letter at the Wichita Public Library, spilling all the bloody details of his sickening acts. And he goes on to give himself that twisted acronym, BTK, which supposedly stood for bind them, torture them, kill them. And we would go on to see this lunatic continue his reign of terror for the next 20 years, taking the lives of five more poor women. She said he used to have two or three times, uh, either here, here, and two back here, and one here, and they were just two times here. He got so desperate for attention that he wrote a letter to some TV station begging to be recognized. He was like, How many people do I have to kill before I get a name in the paper or some national attention? Well, guess what? His plea actually worked. Suddenly, people started paying attention. May 5th, 1985. Raider murdered 53-year-old Maureen Hedge in her home. He took some explicit pics of her in his church. 
Then February 1st, 1991, he killed another lady named Dolores Earlene D. Davis in her quiet house. After that, the whole investigation kind of fizzled out and nobody knew what happened to him. 2004, on the 30th anniversary of his first murders, the local paper started guessing that maybe the killer had kicked the bucket or landed behind bars. But Raider wasn't having any of that. No siree, he sent evidence of his ninth murder. Like a driver's license and some really disturbing photos, he had stashed all his creepy stuff in cereal boxes. January 2005, the police found a cereal box with a note from Raider. He wanted to know if they could track some floppy disk he planned on sending. The cops went along with it and posted a classified ad agreeing to trace the disk. When he sent it, they figured out it came from his church. February 25th, 2005. They matched his DNA to the evidence from the first crime scene and boom, they nabbed him. He confessed to everything in June. And a couple of months later, he was given 10 life sentences without parole. Number 8. Dr. Harold Shipman The Greater Manchester GP Dr. Harold Shipman has been charged with another seven murders. Dr. Shipman is already accused of killing eight patients and he'll face one of the largest murder trials in British history. July 17, 1998, in Hyde, Greater Manchester, Harold Shipman, a respected doctor, was all about serving his community. People really trusted him, and families just loved the guy. But here's the messed up part. Nobody had a clue that behind the calm demeanor was a man responsible for the deaths of probably hundreds of people. Well, here's the deal. Shipman had a sneaky method up his sleeve. He would give his victims lethal doses of a drug called dimorphine, which is like medical heroin. And get this, most of his victims were elderly women who genuinely believed in him and his care. To make matters worse, this devious doctor would forge medical records and certificates making it seem like the patients died of natural causes. So he was covering his tracks real nice, and nobody had a clue about what he was up to. A family doctor from Manchester who was charged last month with murdering one of his patients and forging her will has appeared in court accused of killing three more women. June 24th, 1998. Something really stood out. 81-year-old Mrs. Kathleen Grundy was found dead at home. Dr. Shipman, her doctor, claimed it was a natural death. But things got fishy when her daughter discovered a strange will that left everything to Shipman. Obviously, people started getting suspicious. Mrs. Jean Lilly, 59, Mrs. Eva Lyons, 59, and Mrs. Bianca Pomfret, 49, each met their end under similar circumstances. All three women would die shortly after receiving visits from Shipman with lethal drugs found in their systems. Now, despite Shipman attributing Lilly's death to brain issues and suggesting that the others died of natural causes, subsequent examination revealed the truth behind their untimely deaths. Local undertakers and another doctor started noticing a disturbing pattern. Why were so many of this guy's patients mysteriously dying? They spoke up about their concerns, and the police launched an investigation. As the investigation unfolded, the police discovered Shipman would pop in unexpectedly, administer the dodgy drugs, and then later label these deaths as natural causes. But hold on, he didn't stop there. To throw everyone off his trail, he painted himself as a victim. He faked a burglary at his clinic. He wanted to make it seem like he was being unfairly targeted. Nice try, buddy. The cops didn't buy it. They kept digging and the horrifying truth slowly unfolded. Finally, January 31st, 2000, after a thorough investigation, they convicted this guy of killing 15 patients. Some estimates say that he may have actually killed up to 250 victims. Unbelievable. He got slapped with a life sentence and an extra four years for forgery. Justice served, or so we thought. Then on January 13th, 2004, Shipman was found dead in his cell officially ruled as suicide. However, for those who believe in conspiracy theories, did he fake his own death? Number 7. Pedro Lopez While in prison, Lopez underwent a psychological evaluation. It was determined that he was a sociopath, that he suffered from an antisocial personality disorder. July 1978. Pedro Lopez was arrested in Colombia for attempting to abduct a girl named Marie. But little did the authorities know that they had the monster of the Andes. Lopez, with his reign of terror, had targeted Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. While in custody, 
This guy confessed to the murder of over 300 girls. He would go on describing his modus operandi as first luring the victim away from public spaces with his charm before raping and strangling them with his bare hands. As if it wasn't brutal enough, he also claimed that he occasionally dug out the victim's bodies from their graves and had tea parties with them. When asked about his motive for the murders, he said, I lost my innocence at the age of eight, so I did the same to as many girls as I could. Soon after his confession, he directed the authorities to the bodies of 53 victims, which led to the confirmation of 110 victims in Ecuador. Born October 8, 1948, in Venadillo, Colombia, Lopez had a troubled past. His mother, a prostitute, reportedly threw him out of their home when he was just eight years old after she caught him molesting his sister. By his teens, he already had several run-ins with the law after joining a gang of street children for protection. 1980, Ecuador convicted Lopez, and he received a 16-year prison sentence, the maximum penalty for homicide. Yet the extent of his crimes was arguably more severe than what the sentence reflected. Forensic evidence gathered from the mass grave confirmed his chilling confessions. He does not consciously know right from wrong, and he does not feel guilty or remorseful for what he does. August 31st, 1994. This guy finished up his time in prison and got sent back to Colombia. Fast forward four years. Lopez had a short stint in the hospital for a mental checkup, but they said he was all good, so they let him go after posting a $70 bail. Now, if we take a dive into his rap sheet, we see that he's been caught for stealing cars and trying to sell them, and also a legal firearm. This would give us a peek into his whole criminal lifestyle. But here's where things get mysterious. After his release, nobody really knew where he went. Some rumors started swirling around saying he pulled a disappearing act. The Colombian authorities even put out a warrant for his arrest in 2002 because he was tied to a fresh murder, but they couldn't track him down. In the years that passed, there have been occasional reports of crimes matching his style in areas where he used to operate. The local police tried teaming up to figure out his whereabouts, but they didn't come up with anything solid. It's still a big question mark whether this guy's alive or dead, and that's a puzzler continuing to loom large in South America's crime history. Number 6. Eileen Wernos I have made peace with my lord and I have asked forgiveness. I am sorry that my acts of self-defense ended up in court like this, but I take full responsibility for my actions. From February 29th, 1956 to October 9th, 2002, Eileen Carol Wernos was a pretty infamous serial killer in America. She used to work as a prostitute along the highways of Florida, and from 1989 to 1990, she shot and robbed seven male clients. Wernos claimed that these men either tried to or had actually raped her, so she killed in self-defense. But the law didn't see it that way, and she got sentenced for six of those murders. And before all that happened, Eileen was born on February 29, 1956 in Rochester, Michigan, into a very troubled family situation. After her parents' divorce, she was raised by her grandparents, experiencing neglect and abuse throughout her childhood. Her father, a convicted child molester who later committed suicide in prison, obviously contributed to the chaotic home environment. Facing financial hardship and ongoing instability at home, Wernos resorted to sex work from a young age as a means to support herself amidst the harmful abuse and neglect. Now, during the years of 1978 to 1986, Wernos would get involved in many illegal activities. She got arrested for armed robbery, for trying to pass off fake checks, and for stealing a car. She just kept adding to her bad reputation. And in 1986, she met this woman named Tyra Moore, and they ended up getting into a real intense romantic relationship. That relationship would later play a big part in Wernos getting caught. November 30th, 1989, Wernos killed her first known victim, Richard Charles Mallory, who had an electronics store. She said he had raped her, so she claimed self-defense for his murder. They found his body in December with multiple gunshot wounds. For the next year, Wernos went on a killing spree. She targeted guys like construction worker David Spears, rodeo worker Charles Karksadon, and retired sailor Peter Sims, among others. All the victims were found with multiple gunshot wounds and their bodies were dumped somewhere. January 9th, 1991. Wernos got nabbed at this biker joint called The Last Resort. Thanks to a little help from Tyra Moore, the cops squeezed out a confession. 
At first, Werno said it was all self-defense, but as that story went on, it kept changing. She started implying things like robbery and not wanting anyone around to witness the scene. 1992, she goes on trial for killing Richard Mallory. More trials would follow, and she ended up with five additional sentences. Number 5. Ted Bundy January 24th, 1989. Ted Bundy was in the hot seat, literally in the electric chair. He'd been causing chaos all over the country, and his time was finally up. People were talking though, saying maybe this master of escape faked his own death. Now, Bundy was born on November 24th, 1946 in Burlington, Vermont. His childhood wasn't easy, with a stepdad he didn't get along with and getting picked on because he was shy. But believe it or not, he was pretty smart and had some social skills, which actually helped him do well in college. That's where things get twisted. His psychopathic charm and brain would fool everybody, hiding the evil lurking inside. Between 1974 and 78, there was a lot of fear spreading around various cities. Girls were going missing, getting attacked, and being murdered in the worst way possible. Bundy eventually admitted to 28 of these horrifying crimes. But some people think the real number could have been way higher, like in the hundreds. I'm not asking for mercy, for I find it somewhat absurd to ask for mercy for something I did not do. Tortured for and will suffer for, and receive the pain for that act, but I will not share the burden for the guilt. There were two main things that happened that made everybody freak out about Bundy. 1979, he received a sentence for straight up killing two college students. And then the next year, he would go on to get another sentence, this time being for kidnapping and killing a girl. Put these two together and you have one of the most infamous people of the late 20th century. The guard went outside for a smoke. The windows were open and the fresh air was blowing through and the sky was blue. And I said, I'm ready to go. And I walked to the window and jumped out. <laughs> 1977, he would bust out of custody in Colorado, making him even more popular. When his trial went down, people couldn't help but see how smooth talking Bundy was. Despite all the twisted things he had done, it would go on to make many books and movies about him, with many claiming the media made him out to be some sort of romantic hero. Number 4. Herb Baumeister Investigators believe that Herb Baumeister targeted gay men, killing at least 25 people in the 1990s. June 24, 1996, investigators found 10,000 human bone fragments at this place called Fox Hollow Farm in Westfield, Indiana. Turns out the property belonged to Herbert Richard Baumeister. Baumeister was a businessman who started a thrift store, Say A Lot, in Indianapolis. Married with three children, he was known in the community as a family man. Although he occasionally exhibited strange behavior, it wasn't seen as worrisome. However, investigations started showing that he was suspected of killing a bunch of guys between the 80s and early 90s. Most of his victims were usually seen at gay bars in Indianapolis, making the scene pretty scary. Baumeister was also the main suspect in a series of murders connected to this creepy nickname, the I-70 Strangler. The murders would happen between June 1980 and October 1991, involving at least 11 men. Their bodies would be found near Interstate 70 in Indiana and Ohio. They were all strangled, and some of them were left naked or partially clothed in rural areas or near rivers. The weirdest part about this is the killing stopped once Baumeister bought Fox Hollow Farm, suggesting he started using it as a go-to dumping ground. Among the identified victims from the farm were John Lee Johnny Bayer, Jeffrey Allen Jeff Jones, and Richard Douglas Hamilton Jr. All went missing in Indianapolis between 1993 and 1994. When the cops tried to arrest Baumeister, things would take a wild turn. An arrest warrant was hot on his trail, and he made a run for it. He escaped to Pinery Provincial Park in Canada. And on July 3rd, 1996, at the age of 49, he would end it all with a bang, shooting himself with a 357 Magnum. In his goodbye letter, Baumeister spilled his guts about his messed up marriage and all the business problems he had. Would he admit to any crimes or acknowledge the nasty remains that were discovered? No, he kept shut. Now, even though Baumeister never faced court, the evidence found on his land was enough to make your skin crawl. 
With his sudden exit and all the lingering questions he left behind, he added another layer to his dark history. In the end, the justice that many thought he had coming slipped right through their fingers. Number 3. Jack the Ripper Much is known about the Jack the Ripper case. It took place at the end of the 19th century in London. Several prostitutes were murdered in the dark streets. August 31st, 1888, Whitechapel, London. The body of Mary Ann Nichols was discovered, bearing gruesome wounds that would become all too familiar in the weeks to follow. She was the first of five known victims claimed by an unknown killer who would later be infamously called Jack the Ripper. September 8th, just a week later, the body of Annie Chapman was found in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street. Her injuries, similar to Nichols, showcased a brutality that's too difficult to comprehend. Then a few weeks later, Elizabeth Stride's body was discovered in Dutfield's yard, off Burner Street, with her throat slashed. Within hours, Catherine Eddowes met a similar fate in Mitre Square, but her injuries were more extensive, suggesting a growing brutality in the Ripper's actions. November 9, 1888, marked the most brutal murder of all. Mary Jane Kelly's mutilated body was found inside her room at 13 Miller's Court. The severity of her injuries was such that the scene remains one of the most horrifying in the annals of crime. But after Kelly, the murders suddenly stopped. What happened to Mr. Ripper? Many theories came about. Some claim that he was incarcerated for another crime. Others believed he might have died. But an intriguing theory suggests that he might have faked his own death. So here's what drives that speculation. After November 9th, the killer suddenly stopped killing without ever being captured or leaving any conclusive evidence. It makes you wonder if he intentionally went into hiding. The Ripper was known to be clever and bold, hardly leaving any trace for the investigators to follow. To make things even more puzzling, police received some letters that were supposedly from the Ripper himself. These letters were filled with taunts and details about the crimes, but they suddenly stopped coming, just like the murders. Was it his way of tricking the authorities into thinking he was no longer a threat? or even dead. And there were these whispers of Ripper-like crimes happening in other parts of the world, like the US and South Africa. So even with all the extensive investigations, the authorities never identified a single person as Jack the Ripper. The lack of closure, combined with the sudden halt of crime, just adds more intrigue to the theory that he might have staged his own disappearance. Number 2. Gary Ridgway in Seattle today, a man called the Green River Killer has finally confessed to murdering 48 women and girls, making him the most prolific serial killer in American history. July 15, 1982. Gary Ridgway would be arrested for haunting the Pacific Northwest since the early 80s. Known as the Green River Killer, Ridgway took the lives of at least 49 women, making him one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history. Gary's victims were primarily young women, many of whom were involved in prostitution. Their vulnerabilities made them easy targets. The majority were strangled, often in Ridgway's own home or in his truck. Ridgway would later admit that strangulation was his preferred method because he would like to see the life leave his victim's eyes. Somebody showed evidence of ligature marks, hinting at the horror these women faced in their final moments. His choice of dump sites was calculated. He left bodies in remote forested areas or near riverbanks, especially around the Green River, giving him the name that would become infamous. These places were not just final resting spots. Ridgway would often return to the women he'd killed, engaging in necrophilia. July 15, 1982, Wendy Cofield was found floating in Green River. By early 1984, the count had risen to a staggering 26 victims. Despite the increasing number of bodies and police efforts, Ridgway managed to elude capture, but how was that possible? Part of Ridgway's strategy was to occasionally switch up his dump sites. In the mid-1980s, bodies began appearing in Oregon, which investigators later confirmed were his doing. He also planted some of his victims in clusters, sometimes posing them for shock value or covering them with debris. On top of all this, he would plant misleading clues to divert the police's attention. Ridgway placed gum and cigarette butts from other people at his crime scenes, hoping to create false DNA trails. And he was smart enough to keep painting his pickup truck. 
One notable trait about Ridgeway was how he interwove his daily life with his crimes. Employed in a shop painting trucks, he projected an image of an ordinary man, making it easier to deflect suspicion. In fact, Ridgeway had been in the crosshairs of law enforcement multiple times. In 1984, he even took and passed a lie detector test. However, the tides would turn in the 2000s. DNA technology had advanced, and samples linked him to his victims by 2001. After his arrest, he confessed to 71 murders, but it was only convicted of 49. He would go on to receive 49 life sentences plus 480 years for evidence tampering. How do you plead to the charge of aggravated murder in the first degree? As charged in count two. Guilty. 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 And number one, John List. November 9, 1971, in Westfield, New Jersey, John List, a churchgoer and a dad, used a 9mm Steyr 1912 semi-automatic handgun and his dad's Colt 22 Cal revolver to carry out this tragic event. On this day, Helen, age 47, was shot in the back of the head by her husband. Following this, he did the same to his 84-year-old mother, Alma, aiming above her left eye. And when his daughter Patricia and his son Frederick came home from school, totally unsuspecting, he heartlessly shot them both in the back of their heads. But hold on, we're not done. After doing all of that, he would drive to his bank and close his account, as well as his mom's accounts. He would then drive to Westfield High School to catch his son John Jr.'s soccer game, as if nothing had happened, right? But when he got back home with John Frederick, chaos would ensue. List would go on to shoot his son repeatedly, while John Jr. tried bravely to defend himself. Later on, John Frederick would die with his other family members. The authorities didn't realize what had happened until it was too late. List had already disappeared. The motive? Financial troubles and a distorted sense of religious duty. This guy believed he was saving his family from poverty and sin, making a calculated decision to kill him and then disappear. At least I'm certain that all had gone to heaven now. The letter provided some details of the murders. John got hurt more because he seemed to struggle longer. Years went by and the case grew colder. August 1972, the mansion, Breeze Knoll, a symbol of John's once prominent status, caught fire and was demolished. But in 1989, America's Most Wanted featured List, with a forensic artist showing what he might look like older. This episode was a significant breakthrough because a viewer in Virginia identified him as Robert Clark, their neighbor. By the time they got to the sculpture, I was convinced it was him. Bob is John List. We've got to, we've got to call. Now, during the years he went missing, List had settled in Denver, Colorado, before moving to Midlothian, Virginia. He took up accounting again, remarried, and seemed to lead an ordinary life. This life would be detached from his past, leaving his new wife in the dark about his history. So how did he stay undetected for so long? List had carefully planned his escape, cutting ties and adopting a completely new identity. He refrained from contacting any former acquaintances and consistently avoided activities that might attract attention. June 1st, 1989, almost two decades after the murders, law enforcement would arrest John List in Virginia. His fingerprints confirmed his identity. During his trial, he was sentenced to five life terms in prison. Fast forward to March 21st, 2008, he died at St. Francis Medical Center, Trenton, New Jersey. 